He's at the forefront of content discovery. From Viacom, please welcome Cody Foster. Awesome. Okay, wow, I'm blind. I cannot see any of you. Um, we're going to just jump right into this because I think I only have like 10 minutes. So, deconstructing cognitive bias, why is this important for advertising and marketing? Because it infects all of us. And I'll get into a little bit about how that works uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, process of branded content, agency RFP responses, etc. So, I gave my team a little you know, thought experiment a couple of months ago. And I pretended like I was the client, and I said, I want you to answer an RFP as if you were trying to engage New Yorkers. And I did this specifically because I'm the only New Yorker on my team, and so I knew that they weren't going to bring in any sort of historical context of growing up in New York, and they were going to have to actually go out and research what it means to be a, uh, a New Yorker as if they were trying to respond to a custom audience segment. And so this is what they're, a little bit of what their research uh, sort of pulled in. So they found first and foremost that New Yorkers are mostly interested in certain activities, and one of those activities that came up a lot was brunch. It was very specific to New Yorkers. I'm not saying people from other places don't do brunch, but the frequency and volume that it came up as specific to New York over-indexed. Second, stylish. I think you know that's something that we can all agree on. New York has Fashion Week twice a year. Uh, Madison Avenue, you know, all the cool you know, styles and vibes is something very important to New Yorkers. Third, this concept of hustling kept coming up a lot. You know, the multitasker, the having it all type. And then finally, rude. <laughs> I personally think we've gotten better um, over the years, but still, this is something they said, we over-index for rudeness um, based on a baseline that they had established. And so, you see, I manage uh, a large team of data scientists, and engineers and product developers. So for them, everything is about setting normalized baselines and thresholds so that they can build models off of. And this is what they established. So by that rationale, we would get some sort of weird hybrid of Donald Trump and Anna Wintour. Now we're all laughing because we realize how absurd that is. But what's even more absurd is that we all do this every day. We all respond to RFPs in this way in which we, we sort of cobble together a whole bunch of aggregated uh, data points sort of make an assumptive inference about it and sort of say, this is who this audience is, and, that, and we permanently define that audience to be that you know, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Why do we do that? Well, primarily because we are programmed to do this. You know, the foundations of cognitive science tell us that you know, for you know, tens of thousands of years of evolution up until now, our brains are programmed to neatly compartmentalize information. So this baby, for example, if you, you know, spit out 100,000 images of dogs and then shoot a cat interspersed in between that, you'll actually see this infant sort of stop and have to reprocess, hey, what's going on there? You know, what is this cat all about? I know it kind of looks like a dog, but not really. The reason why we do that from an evolutionary standpoint is because when you're running around in the forest, you can't sit there and overanalyze if that's a predator or a prey. You have to compartmentalize things very neatly and efficiently because, you know, if our computers, you know, excuse me, if our brains are computers, our processing speed is more efficient that way. And so that's why we do this. And so when you think about, you know, prototype theory, you know, if you all in this room right now can think of what's the first bird that comes to your mind and have that imprinted on your, in, you know, in the front of your mind. I promise that most of the people in the room probably thought of something like this. And again, because our, our prototype theory, which is, uh, which, is, which is the extension of our cognitive science or bias evolution, we will mostly believe this based on where we're from, our experiences, and the people around us. But, what, but as we all know is that this is also a bird. And so that's why we really can't establish you know, a prototype when we're thinking about custom audiences and that we have to look at things that are a little bit more nuanced. And so at Viacom, we have to think this way because if you look at all of our channels, they're all technically birds, but some of them are, are sparrows and some of them are penguins. And so that's why we have to eliminate this theory of everything when we compartmentalize custom audience groups like millennial or Gen X or baby boomer into neat little prototypes because quite frankly, they're wrong. And you'll find that they're not going to be as efficient or thoughtful in your, in your uh, de delivery of campaigns and content to them. Here's one practical example, college students. When you think of a college student, what's the image that probably comes into your mind? 
it's probably something along the lines of, you know, an Ivy League student that lives in a dorm. But what you'll see here at the bottom is that most students don't need to worry about overly difficult um, uh, colleges to get into. And then most of them are actually non-residential, which means they're not living on campus. And so we know this because we have this thing called the social echo chamber. And the social echo chamber is something that doesn't only just infect us on a personal level, it also infects us in the industry. Because we look at the same trades, the same thought leaders, you know, thought leaders on stage, and they're telling us the same myths that aren't actually proven, but they're very good for, our, for, our, for a, from a marketing speak standpoint. And so how do we break through this bias? So from a, you know, for, for, for what my team, we look at an unbiased, unsupervised data science process that really looks at what the information is telling us and not what we assume a college student to be, not what we assume you know, uh, a buyer or a consumer for a particular brand looks like. We break those down into two primary functions, which is either predictive modeling or interpretive modeling. So predictive modeling is something along the lines of, we know within a certain you know, variable when a woman is about to get pregnant, so we'll send her certain you know, uh, you know, uh, content or certain coupons, et cetera. And then a clustering algorithm will divide people into, say, viewing behaviors. And we do this because here's an example of, of, of a problem when we look at normalized baselines, is that if you're trying to do a campaign by share or if you're trying to do a campaign by index, you can see how your results will be wildly different. And so, what we, and so if we're trying to reach a certain audience, and at Viacom it's all about viewing and commercials, look if we, if we index by share, these are the top shows that, that this truck owning audience will look at. And if we tried to do this by index, these are the same shows that they would be interested in, wildly different. And so we've normalized that through a patent uh, formula that really normalizes both share and index to maximize the whole holistic view. Practical application, think of the election. Everyone's looking at the same voting data, but everyone is using different methodologies, whether it's a, an ensemble model or traditional census data voter files, and that's why you get these wide variances. So no matter what model that your team is using or your organization, make sure they're using the same one. So even if there is an error bias in the model, at least you're all sharing the same bias and that they're not looking at wild, uh, wild swings. And then finally, just to close up, we'll go back to the prototype, millennial moms. This is probably what most of us think a millennial mom is. Why? Because most of us in this room probably went to good schools, maybe come from good neighborhoods. And so again, you're reinforcing that your, your cognitive evolution or your unconscious bias. And so we think this mom, you know, she's super cool. She probably named her kid Curious. She likes to go and do brunch a lot in New York. <laughs> if you were trying to sell her laundry detergent, you would, you would send out an RFP and say, this is the mom that I want to reach, perhaps. But if you don't have a good data science process that is looking to be a detective and to uncover and discover your best audience, you might not realize that this is your best millennial mom to reach. And maybe she got pregnant in high school, and maybe she does, you know, but she still needs to buy baby formula, and she still needs to buy laundry detergent. And what's, in what's even more interesting, what you might discover if you have a good process of, dis of unsupervised discovery, is that the mom on the left, her, her cluster might actually, from, a, from a, a retail behavior for laundry detergent, might actually fit more with a 55-year-old divorced woman. And that's the opportunity that if you create really good data science processes, you can create pathways to the ideal outcomes. Because um, again, you're not really looking to create decision trees. You're just trying to understand probabilistically where you might want to go. So that is a little bit about how we combine a belief system of being fans first and letting the fans and their information drive our, uh, drive our understanding of their behavior into a functional operating system. So thank you very much. Joining Cody, when she's not brand planning, she's oil painting. Here's Hill Holiday's Alex Hayes. Awesome. So thank you for coming today, Cody. I think, um, you know, when you and I were prepping and even when you were talking, you mentioned um, that millennial isn't the right kind of segment or baby boomers isn't the right segment to refer to. Um, but I'm pretty sure everyone here has seen reports and research almost come past them day to day. So does age have a role in the type of methodology that you have? Yeah. Um, 
you know, they're neat. I mean, millennial, Gen Xer, Gen Y, Gen Z, whatever, they're neat containers. And again, that's because our brains are programmed to create neat containers. Um, I think ultimately, yes, you always want to look at age as a potential trigger, but you also want to look at, you know, what we call an impulse gene. And that is, is someone persuadable to do something based on X, Y, and Z? So if, if you have a persuadable outcome that says, I need to get people onto an automotive, you know, lot to see if they'll buy a car, to me, the age is less important than what are the things that get people onto a, a car lot to buy a car? If it happens to be age, great. But if there, if there happens to be a wide variance in that, that's fine too. And so that's why I think we have to leave ourselves open to the possibility that we're a little bit more like snowflakes and a lot less like, you know, you know uh, an idealized, you know, prototype. I'm curious, can you give an example of what an impulse gene is? Um, yeah, like so for example, we, we did an analysis recently that we found for men who are about to become, who are about to get engaged, their alcohol uh, buying behavior spikes. <laughs> um, okay. so, so, so that would be an example of, of an impulse gene. So we would start looking at, you know, okay, who's, who's you know, you know, spiking, you know, for example, for, for buying alcohol. And then we would say, okay, this person has a higher confidence or a higher probability of, of most likely being uh, engaged within, you know, an X and Y differential. I love it. Uh, so one other question I have, so bear with me. <laughs> In 2020, you get an RFP from a really forward-looking marketing client. Yep. And you see the, the RFP and you just go, you know, shake your hands and you're like, my job is done. I got it. What is in that RFP? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> because currently um, when my team gets RFPs now, we usually just rip them up and, and throw them out, um, which is a little bit disconcerting to not only our branded content department, but also our, our clients. I think... Moving forward, I think RFPs should literally just be, here's a first party data set of whatever retail behavior that we have, whatever you know, viewing behavior, if that's relevant, whatever is in your DMP that you own, that, sh that should just be a file that you just send to whoever your agency or creative development partner is, and that's the RFP. Um, I don't think there really needs to be anything else in there other than that, because that's where, if it's raw data, and if you have a really, you know, consistent data science process that is looking to either predict or interpret, you'll be able to come up with what are those, you know, triggers or what are those impulse genes from within that data set. Um, I would like to say assume nothing. If you send an RFP that already has overfit for that ideal millennial mom prototype, then why even bother sending it in the first place? You should just call someone and say, do this and hang up the phone. So I think, you know, again, Moving forward, I would like to see the RFP revolve into just a, a data transfer. What other information do you look at aside from the segmentation information that kind of comes from the client? Um, as much as possible. So we'll try to, we'll try to uh, do joins on viewing behavior, an affinity model. So, you know, activities, things they like to do, people they, you know, align with, celebrities, social influencers, uh, social behavior, device behavior. Uh, retail behavior, credit card behavior, um, you know, oh, almost anything that we can get our hands on because you can't look at that data in a vacuum. You have to look at, at the correlations between them. Um, I can't tell you how many times people are still looking at social data in a vacuum and not trying to tie that to, to linear data or they're not trying to tie that to retail data. So I would say just get, it, get as much as you can. So one last question. Um, so we have a lot of marketers and advertisers in this room today, and you know tomorrow they're going to be in their office. So what are you going to tell them to go and do, and what are you going to tell them to stop? Um, stop. We all have unconscious bias. I do. You know, you do. Everyone in this room does. If you haven't taken an implicit association test, I highly recommend it. I took one on Harvard's website the other day. I realized I'm a horrible human being. Um, <laughs> And, but we can all get better. And I think the more we you know, question what we know about our, our ideal customer, the more we question that, I think the more accurate we are going to be in our you know, future analysis and assessment of who our persuadables are. Because one thing that my team does very well is not just help identify you know, that ideal you know, custom segment for you, irrespective of those neat you know, marketing you know, containers that are great to write about in Ad Age and Ad Week. Oh, the millennial, yay. 
we also will help you discover audience that you didn't even realize that maybe you should be talking to because they're also, you know, part of that ideal uh, persuadable prototype. So um, I just think just keep asking questions and stay curious about your, your, audi- about your audience or customer and cross validate yourself every couple of months, you know, and say, all right, we started at the top of the year. This is who we were tr- driving for because we thought this was our ideal customer. You know, take three, four, five, six months and then double check that. Maybe it's shifted. Maybe it's same. Maybe, you know, maybe it's grown. Who knows? Well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming today, Cody. We really appreciate it. I still-